Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Chapter 3 of John Rawls' A Theory of Justice is entitled, interestingly enough, The Main Idea of the Theory of Justice. And as it turns out, he's going to introduce several main ideas there that are all connected together. But one of the most important starting points is what he's going to call the uh, initial condition or original uh, position. And it's often talked about as a veil of ignorance because Rawls in fact used that term and we're going to talk about what we're ignorant of in this but first we should think about well why is Rawls bringing this up in the first place his theory of justice and of ethics more broadly speaking is going to rely on an idea of social contract but one that's a bit different than his predecessors. And we'll talk about how the original position is different than the old state of nature that, that Hobbes or Locke or Rousseau brought up in the past. This is a hypothetical condition, just as those were, but it's a somewhat different one. He says that um, we are going to decide in advance how to regulate claims against one another and what is going to be the foundation charter of our society as we're engaging in this thought process. And he says, just as each person must decide by rational reflection what constitutes their good, so at an individual level, that is the system of ends which it's rational for that person to pursue, so a group of persons must decide once and for all what's going to count among them as just and unjust, right or wrong. And here there's a, a you know, difference being made between the good and the right, which we don't have to worry about too much, but it's worth signaling. So we have individual conceptions of the good and individual pursuits of that, perhaps done with other people as well. And then there's a broader conception which involves other people necessarily, and that is that of justice and injustice. Now, Rawls tells us that the choice which rational people would make in this hypothetical situation of equal liberty, equal freedom, assuming for the present that the choice problem has a solution, which he does think is the case, determines the principle of justice, principles rather. And so he says, in Justice is Fairness, which is his, his view, the original position of equality corresponds to the state of nature and the traditional theory of the social contract. But there's some differences here. And he says that um, we're going to choose behind a veil of ignorance, which we'll look at in just a moment. He also tells us that in engaging in this, this choice, what we're doing is choosing the first principles of our conception of justice. So we're choosing how society ought to be ordered in the very broad sense, and we're choosing principles that will be used to criticize and correct any sorts of empirical, that is existing, uh, deviations from this. And this is going to lead ultimately for Rawls, the way that he thinks it's going to go, to a sort of, you know, broadly welfare liberalism uh, that's going to have a strong safety net for, for individuals and going to have certain basic principles. It's also going to have a lot of room for individual freedoms and for, you know, various things like redressing uh, things that have gone wrong, you know, uh, procedures for, for addressing uh, problems. 
So choosing these first principles of a conception of justice turns out to be incredibly important. And that's what the original condition he thinks is going to allow us in part because he says the parties to this, another big assumption, of course, this is very hypothetical, are rational and mutually disinterested. That is, they are following a certain, as he's going to call it, narrow economic conception of rationality, which we'll look at in just a moment. And they don't already have relationships with each other that lead them to take each other into account. So let's talk now about this veil of ignorance, because this is probably the most distinctive part of, of this. And he says, this is different than the, the state of nature as conceived of in the traditional theory of the social contract. Why? It's not an actual historical state of affairs. Some versions of social contract theory think that people actually did, in fact, get together at some time and, and you know, say, we need to organize the society and you know, decide on some really basic principles. There's a lot of criticisms of that point of view as a historically existing construct. Uh, it's very difficult to find any history of that. And if we want to sort of hypothetically extend that back into the past, we're, we're really stretching. Hume pointed out some problems with this that we don't have to go into here. But it's also been thought of as a sort of primitive condition of nature. And he says it's understood instead as a purely hypothetical situation characterized so as to lead to a certain conception of justice. And you could say, well, okay, you know, Locke, Hobbes, they don't actually necessarily commit themselves to their being this, this perfect state of nature. They have hypothetical constructs as well, don't they? Well, let's assume that they do for the moment. They do, but they assume that it's already existing human beings who know something about themselves and know something about the way the world works and how who they are would affect that and likewise be affected by that in relation to others. Rawls says, no, no, we, we leave all of that aside. We are entering into what he calls the veil of ignorance. We don't know a whole bunch of important things. So we don't know, for example, um, nobody knows their place in society, their class position or social status. That's a game changer. So if you are well off and you're creating this new society, you don't know where you're going to end up. As a matter of fact, if you create a society that has incredible inequality of wealth or status or opportunity or other things, and the majority of the population are in the lower strata, there's a very good chance you would wind up in that lower strata. So it'd be irrational for you to decide that in those circumstances. If you know that, well, there's a good chance you'll wind up in the top part, even though most other people wind up in the lower part, because you happen to have gone to Harvard, or you happen to you know, have uh, illustrious ancestors, or pick whatever other distinctive you want. Um, well, then you're no longer behind the veil of ignorance, are you? You have already figured out the rules of the economic, social, political, cultural system. This is saying you don't actually know what, imagine it's sort of like being in a role-playing game. You have no idea what your randomly generated character is going to be as far as where you're coming from and your social status or anything along those lines, who your parents were. He also says, nobody knows um, their fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities. What are those? That's, that's kind of an interest in jargon there, natural assets and abilities. Intelligence. You don't know whether you're going to be particularly smart, or what areas you're going to be intelligent in. Some people are naturally uh, good communicators. Other people are terrible at it, right? Some people can learn over time to go from being bad communicators to good communicators. Being able to learn is itself part of intelligence. Some people, you really can't teach them much of anything. There's all kinds of intelligence, right? 
There's the abilities to, you know, identify abstract patterns and, you know, carry out all sorts of interesting calculations and things like that. All the things we tend to associate over here with IQ. I know there's more involved in IQ than just that, but and then there's, you know, we talk about emotional intelligence and we talk about other things. You don't have any idea where you're going to end up in that. You might be a really great communicator right now with the person who you are. You might be tongue tied in every circumstance. And we don't know also about strength or our bodies. Could be that you are going to be born with some sort of congenital defect that will shorten your life or cause you pain day after day after day, or just hinder you in certain ways. Or it could be that you're going to be uh, given all sorts of really great advantages as well. You simply don't know. He goes on a little bit further and he says, I'll even assume the parties do not know their conceptions of the good or their special psychological propensities. What does he mean by that? So conceptions of the good. Well, we can think of all sorts of traditional conceptions of the good in ancient philosophy. Some people think, for example, like Plato, that it's harmonizing these different parts of yourself. So being a well-integrated person who's effectively ruled by rationality and keep, can keep their uh, appetites uh, more or less within certain bounds and develop the virtues and all of that. Aristotle says something kind of similar, but talks about virtuous activity along with friendships, uh, relationships, and a certain amount of wealth. Um, the Stoics said virtue is the only thing that really counts. Um, you know, the Epicureans said it was pleasure and a, a lack of pain. These are all traditional conceptions. And we might think about today, you know, how people frame success or celebrity or all sorts of other things along those lines. You don't know what you're going to value as the good. You don't know ahead of time what sort of lives you would view as good lives and what sort of lives you would view as bad lives, what sort of lives would be flourishing, what sort of lives would be corrupted or defective in any way. You don't know that. We also don't know, uh, as he calls it, special psychological propensities. You don't know, for example, when it comes to sexuality, who or what you're going to be attracted to, what sort of acts you would enjoy, what sort of things you would find repugnant. You don't know what sort of foods you're going to be interested in, or if you care about food at all, or if you're going to be a wine enthusiast. You don't know what sort of music you're going to want to listen to. You don't know any of these things. You don't know whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. You don't know any of these psychological features of yourself. Now, this takes quite a lot of work to, to uh, bring about, doesn't it? Imagine stripping all of these attributes away from yourself. You, you wouldn't be you anymore. Now, in the lottery of the society that you're going into, you could wind up being you, and that would be just fine. Or you could wind up being somebody who has one quality different from yourself. Or you could wind up being somebody totally different. You don't know what ethnicity or race you will be classified as if race even matters. You won't know what gender you're going to be. You won't know when you're going to be born. You won't know any of these sorts of things behind the veil of ignorance. So if that's the case, he says, what is this going to produce? He says, no one is advantaged or disadvantaged in the choice of principles by the outcome of natural chance or the contingency of social circumstances. Because we're all similarly situated and nobody is able to design principles to favor his particular condition, the principles of justice are the result of a fair agreement or bargain. He calls this a symmetry of everyone's relations to each other. And he says that this is going to produce for us an actual just society, a blueprint for it at least. So, you know, this is, this is actually worth thinking about. Um, nobody is able to design principles to favor his particular condition. Why is he so focused on that? 
because there is a tendency when we're engaging in social engineering to be unfair with respect to that. This is a big problem when it comes to systemic issues. For example, those of race or gender or social class. It's very easy for people who are in a privileged position to downplay the importance of things that act as impediments to other people or as detriments. We could come up with example after example after example of unfairness of this sort, stretching back through, you know, the, through the 21st and into the, the, the 20th century, and we probably would never finish uh, accumulating those examples. So the initial condition is supposed to get us to a point where we can move away from those sorts of issues. Now, he says that um, one feature of justice is fairness is to think of the parties in the initial situation as rational and mutually disinterested. What, what does that mean? He says that it doesn't mean that the parties are egoists, that is, individuals with only certain kinds of interests in wealth, prestige, domination, and those sorts of things. But they're conceived as not taking an interest in another's interests. They are to presume that even their spiritual aims may be opposed in the way that aims of those of different religions may be opposed. So we're not enemies to each other. We're not in a zero-sum game but we can't count on identifying with other people's interests or them identifying with our own. So if we want there to be a space for something that we think we might actually find important, we have to create the space for that. And in doing so, we create it for others who might end up involved in that conception of the good. What does it mean to be rational here? He says that Rationality must be interpreted as far as possible in the narrow sense, standard in economic theory of taking the most effective means to given ends. Um, I'll modify this concept, he says later, but we have to try to avoid introducing into it any controversial ethical elements. And what, is, what does that mean? So we want to think of people as having certain given ends that we all share in common, maybe broadly speaking, you know, things like not being sick and being able to exercise a degree of agency. But we can't build into it any robust substantive conceptions of rationality going beyond this. Because if we do, again, we're no longer within the original position and we're kind of playing favorites. The last thing that I want to say about this is we can carry out this, this thought experiment on our own. We can think, okay, so I don't know where I'm going to end up in this society. What kind of society would I make? Mm, I might be male or female or non-binary. Um, I might be attracted to, you know, one gender or another. Maybe I'm not interested in sex at all. Maybe I want to have sex with anything that moves. Um, what kind of foods do I want to eat? Oh, I might have a food allergy. Mm. Uh, what if I have this? What if that leads me to other things? What if I have this disease or this disease or this disease? Oh, what, what if I can't enjoy certain things and I enjoy other things in ways that other people find repugnant. What, how, how should I arrange society? We can carry all this out on our own. We can say, what kind of profession would I have? Should I be a woodcutter or a record spinner or maybe learn to code? And, oh, but maybe that's not going to be around that, that far down the line. Maybe I should be a librarian. Maybe I should be a teacher. Maybe I should be a home care nurse. We don't know where we're going to end up. And we're doing this by ourselves, right? So there's a dialectical process going on in our head. And then we think about, well, what kind of society would I need to make so that I don't end up on the short end of the stick when, when I end up being a African-American female home health care nurse living in uh, a rough part of town that doesn't have good access to public transportation and uh, is in a food desert. Oh, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't make the society discriminate against people like that in that condition. I can do this on my own, but 
Rawls actually, in this, this hypothetical thought experiment, intends that we would be doing it with others. So we would enter into it. We'd try to go into this veil of ignorance as best as we can. And then we'd see what other people have to say. And the assumption here is that we are rational, but we're not robots. We're not all exactly the same. And so we have to have some sort of discussion with others. A little bit earlier, he talked about it as involving a kind of um, bargaining, right? Or a sort of fair agreement that we would be engaged with, with other people. And a little bit later, he says that, um, yeah, we, we would want to be engaging with others so that they can bring up things that we're missing out on. And he notes, too, that um, we're not going to necessarily get everything that we would want for ourselves in the exact people that we are. But that's part of the point of going behind the veil of ignorance. So it's, it's taking into stock the possible conditions and outcomes for people across the board and abstracting away from the concrete existing individuals who we are. This is the beginning point for his theory of justice. 